I've been in my life, I've probably been to about more than a dozen vampire graves uh, in New England specifically. And it's, they're, they're all the same story. People would start getting sick. They'd start becoming pale and wasting away and, and becoming kind of no energy. So at the time, they thought that was vampirism. And usually because more than one person would be afflicted within the family, they thought the vampire was actually in the family. Like there was somebody they recently buried. So these days we know it wasn't vampirism, it was tuberculosis and it was highly contagious. But back then they didn't know that. So they'd go out to the family plot and dig up all the relatives. And then they would see who is the most preserved body of all these relatives. And whoever it was, they would do some ritual. The rituals change depending on the town. Sometimes they would just arrange their bones in a cross formation. Some, in the case of Mercy Brown, probably the most famous in Rhode Island, they took her heart, which was still preserved, and ground it up into ash and mixed it with a drink and had the person who was suffering from TB drink oh. it. We were just talking about cursed objects. <laughs> I know a little bit yeah. about that. Yeah. Priscilla was talking about the objects and I was saying, well, there's a difference between cursed objects, a possessed object, you know, it's like, uh, what are all the ways something can be haunted, possessed? What's the difference between haunting possessions and being cursed? Yeah, no, I had to figure that out myself in order to like come up with a list. But I think haunting is ghosts, however you define ghosts, right? They could be spirits from the afterlife. Possessed is demons, very specific type. Although some experts say that objects can't be possessed only people can so who knows but that's the difference there it's two different types of entities and then cursed has no real intelligence behind it it's it's just a thing that brings misfortune or harm or bad luck but there is crossover too like a haunted object could also be cursed and you know it, it, there, there's definitely some crossover but well, wait I, I just have to ask because this has been a a theme throughout my life you know, where I will wear a certain necklace or a certain piece of clothes, something like, and really something terrible happens. And then I'll, I'll say, I'm never touching that again. And then I'll say, I'll be brave. Like a year and later. Then, I'll and then something out. else terrible. Will happen. Yeah. And like, it's you know. true. And I want to know, like, I mean, I've been reading your book, so about this, but what do you, is it that I'm creating so much energy around it? Like what, what, how would you even describe it? Jesse, yes, don't know. Yes, you yes, answer. yes. You are you are not an expert. He's also a I may not be an skeptic. expert in these kinds of things. So is he. So is he. I know you're a skeptic, yeah. JW. I happen to be not, but anyway. Yeah. So what Well, you- I would say, first of all, congratulations that you know what could be the cause, because usually with the cursed object, if it's a mundane object, and you never know. Like I, I always say, like, if your ottoman's cursed, you're never going to suspect that thing. That, that's so dangerous of it. You know, if, if you have a human skull in your house, you'll suspect yeah. that. Yeah. You'll never suspect the ottoman. You never suspect the chest of drawers. Yeah, exactly. You never would. You, you'd go through a million things in your house and you'd never realize that's the cause of your troubles. But I think for you, I would say, I'll, be, I'll do the skeptic side. First time's coincidence, right? But after that, once those are connected, because you know, if you read the book, then you know about the nocebo effect where, you know, it's the opposite of the placebo where our body can heal itself with very little provocation and very little even scientific provocation. The body might also be able to harm itself with very little provocation, which, you know, is, is exactly what a cursed object could be. If I think this thing's going to bring harm to me, that might be enough to bring harm to yourself. But yeah, so that that would be my thing. But it could also just be a good old fashioned cursed object you're wearing. You know, it could, well, could exactly, be exactly. Okay. And you might just be buying lots of cursed objects. And that <laughs> might be what's happening with you. You know. Well, that would mean something else. That would mean what? I ha- I, I have a I have bad luck or something. I'm not really sure. No, it just know. might be that you're buying cursed objects one after another. You don't realize it. You know what I mean? So so a ring. Like if I dig up a ring in my field, right? Mm-hmm. What kind of cursed object is that? Uh, you what as as far as like like a gold ring. If I digged up a gold ring and then like a few years later I found something else a couple hundred miles away, you know what Are would you, that be? You're talking about the ring of Sylvianus, right? Oh, coincidentally, yeah. <laughs> That's one of my favorite stories because I mean, so like you said, a ring was found in, in England where they dig up stuff on accident every single day, just kicking dirt. They dig up like hundreds of year old artifacts. Found a ring, th- thought nothing of it had the name i believe it was uh, sylvianus was on the was the name on the ring but then they found a cursed tablet so this is a pretty common thing back in the days where you know they'd go to their pagan temples and they would inscribe curses onto little little thin sheets of metal and then donate them to the gods along with some money so that the curse would actually take effect right these are these are roman artifacts yes you know? exactly roman artifacts exactly um defixiones is, is what the, the roman term for them and they found one where a guy named sylvianus was accused of stealing a ring 
So immediately they thought of this ring that had the name Silvianus on it. So the idea is that, so the, these, these Roman temples were also like, they're like locker rooms like baths like they would go and soak there and they they put their valuables in lockers or whatever the roman equivalent of lockers back in the sixth century bc was but um the idea is that somebody stole somebody's ring at this at this temple so the guy immediately put a curse on them now the interesting thing about the ring is it's it also had an inscription that said something like god protect me and it was misspelled so the idea is that he stole the ring knew he just stole it from a person who could do a curse in two seconds because he was at a temple so he immediately had a, a blessing engraved on the ring to counteract the curse <laughs> but instead you know did it so fast that they that they misspelled it so but that's not even the interesting part that they found these two artifacts that might be connected uh, across time this the story that should have been lost to the world the interesting thing about it is the site that they found the defixiones was a place called dwarf hill one of the researchers one of the archaeologists wanted to do some research into dwarf hill and the, the the main god there the pagan god was called nodens so he needed a an expert in medieval practices is what he needed so he called up oxford because this is england and when you need smart people you call up oxford and said hey can you send me an expert in, in languages so i can learn about this god nodens and they sent them a man named john ronald rule tolkien so J.R. tolkien shows up to look at this cursed ring and then what a year later comes out with the the, the hobbit which, yeah, which, which involves a, a cursed ring and dwarves and all those kinds of things so this object that was cursed possibly cursed and lost and found gave us our biggest epic of fantasy and today the rings on display at a museum in england they they display it right beside a, like a first edition of the hobbit so they, they really play up that connection pretty hard you know why is the hope diamond so cursed yeah oh i have a theory on this one too because the Hope Diamond is so, is so cursed because it's only rich people have had it. It's so, it's so expensive that only rich people have had it. And rich people are, are cursed objects themselves almost. They bring all kinds of <laughs> bad stuff into their right. lives. I know it's through boredom, through whatever, through you know generational wealth, kind of like whatever, making worse people. But it's got a huge long history, right? So it started in the mines in Kolar in India, right? Or it started whatever, thousands of years before that, just being made in the, in the Earth's crust. Got dug up in India, a uh, giant blue diamond, very rare bought by a French merchant. He didn't steal it from the eye of an idol. That's, like, that's always the story is he stole it from the eye. He saw lots of jeweled idols for sure, but this one he just bought like a merchant, gave it to the King of France who, you know, put it in the Royal Jewel collection, cut it down, made it more fashionable, wore it. And then eventually, you know, the French Revolution happened as it always does. And then and I can't, I can't the people that got their heads cut off, their names escaped me. They owned the blue diamond at the time. Yes, right. so they, they got their heads cut off. The blue, the diamond got lost. They they think it was actually given to the English to pay them off. Because what happened was, so while the French Revolution was happening, all the other European countries were amassing armies because they were afraid that revolution would spread to their countries too. So the English were sitting there with an army saying, hopefully it doesn't catch on here. Uh, they got paid off with the diamond. They hid it because by the time Napoleon rolled around, he wanted to rebuild the, the French jewel collection. So they cut it down farther to hide it. And then it ended up with Joseph Cartier, the famous gym, right. uh, gym yeah, guy. Cartier, Cartier's, yeah. yeah, Cartier. So he had it. And what he did with it was he realized that there's a new form of aristocracy over in America, just rich business people over here and, and stars and stuff. Those were the new royalty of the day. You know, so the Kim he, Kardashian of their time. Exactly. So he found one of those, Evelyn Walsh. And he put little he put little diamonds around it, made it really pretty the way it looks today if you go to see it at the Smithsonian. But he knew that these rich people could buy a thousand hope diamonds and, and just bathe in them if they wanted to. So he knew that in order to sell this thing as special, he had to give it a story. So he's really the one that kind of wrapped the curse story around it. He had lots of fodder for it. This thing has been around for hundreds of years. Yeah. You know, in general, if you're around around people for any given amount of time, you're gonna be around bad stuff. So he, wo he wove the curse tighter around this jewel, sold it to Evelyn Walsh who then, a very rich DC socialite, had a lot of troubles. She had, I think, a, a child die and her husband died in a, a suicide in an asylum. I think she ended up in an asylum, but she yeah. used to do a lot of weird things with it. She'd like let her dog wear it around. She pawned it at one point <laughs> to try to fund the chasing the killer of the Lin or the, at the time kidnapper of the Lindbergh baby. So yeah. she was all over the place. She died and eventually went to another rich person who donated to Smithsonian for a big tax break and to start an American chest of jewels. And that's where it is today. It's the most... I mean, I'm told by Smithsonian that's the most popular attraction in the entire Smithsonian is the Hope Diamond. So now it's this attraction, mm -hmm. and does the is the lore of it, you know, kind of the curse of it, still part of the attraction, or you know, what is what makes it, or is it just this big beautiful thing? Uh, big, I think it's all those things. So it's a big beautiful thing. Also has a really big, his, just a legit history, just like a documented history of hundreds yeah. of years. But it's really the curse, right? It's it's it's, it's this thing that. 
you know, some people even weave entire stories about how, you know, once this was in the America's attic, America's collection, America started going downhill as a country. Ah. So that, that so it's cursing the entire country. Oh. And honestly, the way cursed objects work, if you just visit it, you can be cursed. Like just writing about a cursed object. A lot of a lot of journalists are in in the body count of cursed objects. So just showing interest in an object can curse you. So just going to see this thing is dangerous. Well, what about you curses. when you when you write about all these things? What happens to you? Oh, it was foremost. So I'm not a believer, but it was foremost in my head that it, it doesn't matter if you're not a believer, if it's true, you know, it, it doesn't matter what I believe. So yeah. I was definitely scared, especially when I, I sit there and I write about journalists who are writing articles about, you know, Otzi the ice mummy and dying of like blood cancer a month later. So it was in my head that if my bigger fear was not that I would die from the curse, but that I would just die in general. And then for the rest of my life, my obituary was the rest of my death. My obituary would say, Jason Oker, author, died writing about cursed objects so kind of had it coming so i was afraid that my, i would be another body count for the for the cursed objects so does this account for why egypt is not the top country in the world now because everything that gets dug up there is a is a cursed object yeah it's all cursed. yeah and then and then it's all in their museums and then they spread it around the world although now they have that giant museum that they've been trying to open since the pandemic of every single piece of like egyptian alia but yeah they're like the, they're the top ones I, they're in the book like two or three times just because there's so much everything there is cursed you know, did the curse start with going into King Tut's tomb or did this curse start before that? So King Tut's tomb was the famous one, but there was a template for it before beforehand was something called the mummy board. Right. And the mummy board predated King Tut's tomb or the finding of King Tut's tomb. And it's just this, it's not even a mummy. It's the lid of a mummy case that's kind of painted with a person on it. Right. That's just sitting today, actually, in the British Museum. You can go see anytime you want. It's, it's kind of not, not interesting because it's in like a room full of mummy boards and rooms. Right. And actual mummies, which are the interesting parts. But that one was the one that first had a curse story around it. I mean, it, it was rumored to do everything from sinking the Titanic right. to like uh, starting World War II. Like anything bad that happened that Britain was anywhere near, people would blame the mummy board. But we do, is this because we need something to blame horrible things on? Like what is the history of, of a, you know, not the cursed object itself. And how did you get, how did you get into all these yeah, things? Yeah, like, like let's start back with how you're, you know, you are a skeptic or so like what, or a non-believer, what gets you into this in such a ferocious way? I love everything about people that believe this stuff. Um, ghosts, um, aliens, anything. I, it's more interesting to me. Like the, the concept of a cursed object is way more interesting than the concept of a jewel, right? right. And it's, it's a little bit of a bias on my part. Jewels are very, very interesting, obviously. But for some reason, I've always been drawn to the weird and the fact that people can believe it. That I, I love that ghost stories exist as stories, but I also love that there are people that believe ghost stories are real. And those people are usually the people I have more fun with as well. <laughs> They're usually like, I don't know, the people I want to be around. Skeptics like me are like dry and like we're, we're, we're big wet blankets and buzzkills. But, you know, people that believe things are a lot more interesting. So that's generally where I am. I just love the macabre. Like, I also have an aesthetic around it. Like, I always tell people I just love the shape of a human skull and old graveyards. <laughs> why I moved to New England. I love old graveyards. The feel of them are good. And that's that. all that stuff goes hand in hand with ghost stories and cursed objects and cryptids, other stuff I do. So recently you met Stephen King, yeah? <laughs> sort of, yeah. My my wife more like that. So it was this probably 2015 I was up for an award so he was also up for an award D different categories fortunately but yeah. we were both up for an award and um what they did was there's was a it was in Manhattan and there was a um pre-gathering of people that were all nominees I guess right. is, is the word so we all got like a little private ceremony of just hanging out meeting each other you know seeing who was gonna be the sad people at the end of the night and who's gonna be the happy people at the end of the night we were at the bar it's like this little six it's like a hotel so this six foot long bar that's mobile on wheels or whatever and James Elroy was there, the uh, the, the oh, novelist. Oh, you know? yeah. Yeah, so we were, he, I think he was the guest of honor or something like that. So he was there, and me and my wife just went over to, like, get a drink, really. I mean, I'm not a, I'd never read James Elroy, so I don't know much about him, but I, I knew him by face, for sure, name. Yeah. So we went over there, just, just getting our drinks, annoying him. It was so small that I was behind my wife to get drinks. And yeah. Stephen King came up to see Elroy, but yeah. we were in his way. So he was, he, you know, he's, he, he <laughs> couldn't get behind us. So I'm like, I'm freaking out. I'm like, look, Lindsay, the Stephen King is behind you and trying to get through. <laughs> I wasn't even talking to him. Like he was not even a person to me. He was just this looming figure. Yeah. So she pops right around and says, oh, hi, Steve. I'm, I'm Lindsay. He sticks her hand out and shakes his hand. He's like, hi, Lindsay, I'm Stephen. Yeah. And then, you know, we got his way and he goes over to James and says, finally, we meet James. And like, they go on and have a conversation. Oh. But that was, that was our brush for Stephen King. <laughs> so how do you start going? Because you went to all of Edgar Allan Poe's places where he grew up. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I went to all sites that uh, he, any site that is preserved that he had connection with, plus 
artifacts, pieces of his coffin, pieces of his body, hair and stuff. <laughs> wow. Anything connected to uh, memorials, anything connected to Poe that still survives in modern day in the six or seven places he lived. Now, are you just a fan of the, you know, fall the house of Usher or, or the Raven or? Yeah, I grew up a fan of Poe. Pretty typical story. It turns out everybody I talked to had the same kind of story where you're, you're going to school and you're reading boring stuff as a kid. And then one day they give you Edgar Allan Poe, tales of murder and like yeah. macabre. And you're like, whoa, this is, this is different than any other book you've given me, Captain's Courageous or whatever yeah. you gave me. To read is a classic. And then you immediately become enamored of it. And so he's always been like a presence in my life. And I love physical objects. That's another reason why cursed objects appeal to me so much. Is I love anything physical. So I started my entire writing career going to see physical things and taking pictures. And like, if you tell me a ghost story, I'll be like, oh, that's cool. But if you're like, and that ghost story took place at this covered bridge, right. then I'm way interested. I want to go see the covered bridge. So with Poe, I found out that like, he lived in about seven different, six, seven different states and England over mm -hmm. the course of his life, just trying to find money because he was poor all the time. And I found out there's a lot of stuff left over from him and a lot of memorials. Like every single city had a memorial to him. So right. I kind of put together that I could turn it into a travel. I could write a travel book based on Edgar Allan Poe's life. Right. Uh, that would be kind of a weird biography. A weird, like build his life from his pieces that are yeah. left over. And man, it was such, it was one of my favorite years of my life. I met friends as a result of that book that I still talk to these days. And like, it was, there's a whole cult of Poe that are just like, wonderful people now did you did, did you Jesse, have a tell him well, you were obsessed with poe what is your well, obsession well, i don't I mean, we're not here about my obsessions we're here about his <laughs> obsession all right go on but but when you were in these places did you feel his presence there did you i mean what were your impressions right it was very surreal because up to that point i think poe was just a uh, caricature for me a figure a figurehead mm -hmm. he was just this he was poe he was this thing this, a mustache and, and dour look and he wrote brilliant stuff and that's pretty, pretty much all i knew but then it, it becomes a real person when you like you're standing in his house in the Bronx, like mm -hmm. ab above the bed where his wife died, or you're mm -hmm. in his honeymoon suite in Virginia that still survives, or you're literally looking at a piece of his coffin or standing above his grave. It, it makes him like this real person. And then you kind of read more widely of his stuff and you see all like 60% of his writing was humorous. <laughs> it wasn't sp spooky. Yeah. Like you read all of his letters and most of them were him begging for money. Right. And you start, you start seeing him as a real person behind the genius. And it's, it just, it just makes the work that much bigger, right? When you read about all the stories of loss and mm -hmm. death and, and terror, you're like, oh, you know, there's, there's a human being behind that, that they experienced a lot of the stuff. Now, did you start doing that before you'd go to ghost towns and graveyards and bogs mm -hmm. and things? Ghost Town. So the po I've been a fan of Poe since a teenager. I, I definitely remember specifically sitting down and the Raven just blowing my mind and not even for a class assignment. I read it and memorized it. I had to, I was so blown mm. away by it that I had to have it in my DNA. I had to have it right. in a piece of me. And right. I just sat in my bedroom and for three nights and memorized that gigantic poem. So that Poe has been around, has been a figure in my life forever. But he is part of that kind of melee of me liking ghost stories and Poe. The Finding Oddities didn't start until after college, honestly. I was like in my mid-20s, I think, when I really started like going after weird stuff with a passion. Now, at what point do you meet your wife and at how soon after do you start to explain this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> so I, I met my wife about maybe less than a year into this project. So the okay. project already started. It had already started kind of getting traction. And how did you explain it? <laughs> I sent her the website link yeah. <laughs> and said, read this. Turns out though, it was a pretty good match because she's a photographer. And okay. so I had somebody could take pictures. It was, it was uh -huh. at the end of the day, it was travel. Even though you end up at like a smoking ghost town, like Centralia, right. it's still travel at the end of the day and she loved travel. So it really worked out. And it, what I also love about it, even with my family today, my kids, is it gives us something to do. Like you, any mm -hmm. other, I don't even know what regular people do with their Saturdays anymore because we're always just looking for something to go see and spend time seeing, whether it's a ghost town or yeah, it's a weird a, store or something. That's a lovely thing to do with family. How many kids do you have? I've got three daughters. Yeah. So, you know, and they, they've seen some really weird stuff in their lives so far. So have you ever had a feeling at one of these places? You're a skeptic. So have you ever had a feeling like mm -hmm, something's not right here or is it always, you know, how do you, cause you're, you know, you're going into it. Not real. I've definitely been scared before. Like the irrational fear of darkness and loneliness and stories, scary stories can mm -hmm. get to me every single time. Most of the time though, it, it gets, uh, so I never had like a parent, anything I can interpret as paranormal. Don't mm -hmm. have anything like that. Even if I was like exaggerating for stories, I don't really have one, Right. but I have definitely freaked myself out. Um, usually it happens not when I'm on assignment. Usually like if I'm, a, if I'm at a dark graveyard in the middle of the night at a whatever haunted headstone, I'm kind of hoping something happens I can write about. Otherwise it's a very boring story. I, right. I walked to it. I saw it. I left. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping anything weird happens where I usually get hit is at my house where I don't expect spooky stuff to happen. So if everybody's gone in my house, they're at relative's house, I'm by myself for two days. 
I will sleep with lights on. I will, you know, avoid horror movies. I will freak myself out really fast. Actually, you don't expect, like, I expect, like, a, you know, a phantom apparition in a graveyard, hopefully, but I don't expect one coming out of, like, my garbage disposal, you know? Right. That, that would really kind of hurt me, I think. I, I want to ask you a question. I want to go deeper into your skepticism. I mean, mm -hmm. are you looking for something to overtake you and overwhelm you, you know, and so that you can believe or, or are you skeptic because, you know, you just want to see it's not really true. You know, this <laughs> no, is I would, really happening. I would be the happiest person on the planet if something happened to me. I want the world to be weirder than it is. And if I could believe in ghosts, it would be immediately weird or cryptids or whatever. Uh, and I actually grew up believing in that. I was, I was a Christian for a lot of my life. So I believed in like holy ghosts and resurrected messiahs and demons and angels and a spiritual world. So I once upon a time had those beliefs, witches and ghosts even are a part of that world. So I would love to, to, to know that, you know, I would love to be one of the weirdos again. Now, <laughs> so. now what pulled you out of that? Um, well, I was in it for a long time, probably about 25 years. And then I was, I, I kind of got out of the fishbowl. So I grew up really indie fundy, like the most hardcore Christian you could be. Mm -hmm. So I was at church a lot. I went to Christian schools, went to Christian college for my undergrad. And then after that, when I got in the real world and out of the fishbowl, it just reality didn't seem to conform to the reality I had been taught growing up. It seemed to be a totally different reality. So I just kind of sloughed it off over the course of years and became, you know, a cynic and nihilistic and now, now, <laughs> now, cursed objects, you know, there's a lot of them. Can I buy a cursed object on eBay? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I that, that's exactly what I did. So if you go to eBay right now, type in cursed objects, you'll see tons of stuff. Some of them pretty expensive as well. And a lot of dolls. What happened to me is that when I first started, because every, every single nonfiction book project I do, like I said, I have to be a part of it. I can't be objective. I have to tell people my story. I have to be a character in the story. So for this one, I had to buy a cursed object. So I was searching for one on eBay. I had various criteria I had to fulfill. I didn't, I didn't want to like spend too much money on it for all kinds of reasons. I needed it to be not ugly because I wanted to be in my office. I didn't, it could be, could be a doll. could be creepy. I looked and I, then I left and I looked again. And what started happening is eBay started running targeted ads across my entire digital experience. <laughs> right. So it would say stuff like cursed objects. We have cursed objects. Come back to eBay. Right. Obviously they did, did the algorithm just filling in like their, their, the verbiage into the, we have, if you're looking for lamps, we have lamps, come see lamps on eBay. So I was literally being chased around the internet with eBay trying to actively sell me cursed objects. So it was, it was a nice little kind of interaction, the digital and the classic, because that was also a theme of the book is that digital things can be cursed as well. By the way, I'm on there and it's scary. There's like a nun, like a nun, scary looking nun, 16 inch <laughs> doll, like uh, creepy. So, so vampires, you know, there just was a series on with, um, a great actor, you know, that deals with uh, the you know vampires. No, that's uh, we need good. a I can't remember what it is. You know, the, well, he comes back graves? on a ship. He comes back on a ship, and then he goes back to to New England. But New England is where a lot of these people who were accused of being vampires yeah. lived. So, mm -hmm. did you do a tour of vampire graves? I've been in my life. I've probably been to about more than a dozen vampire graves uh, in New England, specifically. And it's, they're all the same story. And I, I'll tell you why I love the story after it. But the, the basic story is people would start getting sick. They'd start becoming pale and wasting away and and becoming kind of no energy. So at the time, they thought that was vampirism. And usually, because more than one person would be afflicted within the family they thought the vampire was actually in the family. Like there was somebody they recently buried. So these days we know it wasn't vampirism, it was tuberculosis and it was highly contagious, but back then they didn't know that. So the way to do that would be to go out to the family plot. And this wasn't something they did in the dead of night. This was conventional wisdom, newspapers reported on it. They'd go out to the family plot and dig up all the relatives. And then they would see who is the most preserved body of all these relatives. And whoever it was, they would do some ritual. The rituals changed depending on the town. Sometimes they would just arrange their bones in a cross formation. Some, in the case of Mercy Brown, probably the most famous in Rhode Island, they took her heart, which was still preserved, and ground it up into ash and mixed it with a drink and had the person who was suffering from TB drink oh. it. And then, you know, that, that's it. That's it. That, that's the vampire grave. But what I love about it is you can visit these graves today. And this is, again, why I like physical objects. Where you are is you're at the site where it happened, above the entire cast of people that it happened to and happened with, Mm. Like if you could just go back in time without moving, it would all be happening right around you. And you're just in that physical spot. It makes history so much more real. It makes people so much more real. And it all just happened right there. The stage, the characters, the, it's all right there in the graveyard. Are they marked? Or can you read them? Yeah, they, they never say anything about the vampirism. I've only seen one grave that had the word vampire on it and it was just being poetic. It called death the vampire's clasp. The other graves are just, they're just regular epitaphs. They don't actually say, you know, <laughs> also, now, we dug them up and they're a vampire. <laughs> now, why are dolls always such a giant part of cursed things, you know? 
I, so it's a good question. I mean, we all kind of have that intrinsic, not most of us anyway, not love of dolls. Like as, as adults, we just don't like dolls for some reason. Mm -hmm. And I'd have no idea what it is. If it's just diminutive fake people are scary <laughs> in themselves, the look on their faces, the innocence of a doll combined with like age. I definitely agree with it. I definitely ascribe to that they're creepy as, as anything, but I can't quite nail the exact thing of, of the psychology behind it. But I definitely agree with it for sure now would you consider them monsters or is monsters something else probably not i mean if they're cursed objects they're just cursed objects if they're living dolls if they're like chucky or whatever they're definitely monsters but uh in general they're just another cursed object or haunt those are very popular haunted objects dolls are so what's a myth you know what's a myth and what's a monster you know so are you talking about in terms of where it would fall in the story in the narrative sense yeah yeah i would put so, so dolls can be in the monster category. The most famous one is probably um, Annabelle mm -hmm. from the Warren collection that now has her own entire whatever series yeah. of movies. I would put her in a monster category, even though she's just a Raggedy Ann doll, classic Raggedy Ann right. doll. She's supposed to be haunted by a, by a child, a child soul, she's supposed to have actually like, you know, attacked people. Like right. literally caused drew, drew blood in one case they even said this is all from the warrens of course to take it for the grain of salt but she uh, was instrumental in a, a motorcyclist death for making fun of her so that's definitely a monster which is why you can build a whole series of movies around her is because she she is monstrous others are more you know you, you watch a horror movie and they're more set dressing you know there's spooky dolls just kind of around and they just set the right atmosphere for the movie those are more kind of like they represent the ghost childs i mean it seems like most horror films have objects in them now right it's like is it a yeah. convention of the form that there it's a haunted object in some sense yeah i actually had that realization when i was writing the books i wanted to do something about cursed objects in film and i figured there'd be like a small number of them but really almost every horror film is a cursed object film because there has to be some kind of kickoff to the story right and, and usually it comes from an object right a seal is open the hellraiser box the you know there's usually always a, something physical the necronomicon they, they find that unleashes whatever horrors happen throughout the rest of the movie it's rarely based on anything but they find something so it almost every single movie horror movie is a cursed object movie in some form or fashion now you spend a lot of time writing about new england in a way is that because mm -hmm. those are places you can get to are you from new england i'm not from new england i'm from maryland from the dc area yeah. um lived there for about 29 years first 29 yeah. years of my life a few years in florida but mostly in dc i moved to new england on purpose i loved it i love new england i love new england because it's the oldest area of the country right we have graveyards that go back to the 1600s 1500s i pass probably three or four ancient graveyards on the way to the grocery store i just love that right. first house i bought in new england was built in 1890 and it was a it wasn't a historic house. It was a schlubby house. It wasn't even right. a good house. Right. But it, but there, there's so many of them up here. Like back home in D.C., if you had a house from 1890, that'd be immediately uh, on the historic register mm -hmm. and like all these rules around it. But it, it was just a random house. So I love the age. I love the spookiness of their falls. I wanted white Christmases, which is, you know, a way to guarantee that it's come to come to New England. So I just love the area. And that's really what started my book career is I got came up here. And was like, oh man, New England is a thing more than any other place in the country. New England is a thing. Mm -hmm. So why don't I take this website that I'm writing about every state and just just focus on New England and then sell it to a New England publisher, and, and then it all worked out. So New England really, my fascination New England started it all. But why do you think? You know, I'm from New England and I left. I mean, I'm from, <laughs> I'm from yeah. Boston, but I, you know, I haven't been back in it forever. But why do you think all of the? It's a haven or a center, really, a hub of all of this creepy activity. weird stuff yeah i mean is it because everybody came over first and it was the first place where well, yeah possibly so like they always fight with virginia jamestown over who came first but if you look at the motivations right jamestown came as a business venture yeah the massachusetts bay colony was religious so the foundations in puritanism i think is what really is what so puritans came over seeing monsters everywhere right they, they were they believed the same kind of cosmogony i believed when i grew up that there were devils in the woods and witches in the woods so they believed in this thing right away. And I think that's that stayed. That that kind of stayed in the in the kind of world, which is why we can go to vampire graves and we can go to witch trial memorials and right. all these things are still there. So I think it all goes back to the Puritans that why why it was so spooky. But Salem, everything it's cracked up to be when you went there. Yes, yes. I, I tell people that read the book, uh, my Salem book, like and, and liked it. People that liked it. I'm like, yeah, you will not be disappointed. In fact, these days it's probably ramped up even more um everything's going bigger and bigger it's getting year round now so year round you can see see spooky stuff but it also has like a much more not spooky side a lot, lot more restaurants a lot more culture events that kind of thing but yeah it, it won't disappoint at any time of year 
so is history all around us you know like everywhere we are i'm in california but we're still in california now it's like is it all around us if we're just willing to look for it yeah i always say and i i, I think of it in terms of oddity like within a tank of gas of anywhere in the country maybe maybe in the midwest it's two two tanks but within a tank mm -hmm. of gas is like untold wonders i mean i use myself in this example like i'm learning about new things just an hour from my house every single month when the pandemic was here and we we're all under lockdown i found tons of ghost towns that i I'd never even heard of, even though I've lived here for 12 years yeah. uh, and, and specifically look for that kind of stuff. And I was finding places I'd never heard of. And it, it, so it is around us. And it, it's just a matter of like finding the story and then, you know, going to the thing. What does your oldest daughter, what does she think about all this? She loves it. She wants to go on these road trips with me now. One of the things we get to do recently for cryptids, which is just monster, a book of monsters, we get to go hunt for the Mothman in West Virginia. So we went to these old TNT bunkers in the middle of the forest at night, oh. flashlights. And like, she loves it a lot. She's... The adventures are really, she's starting to get it. Like my, around seven or eight, which is where my middle child is, they don't like the road trips as much. They don't like getting stuck in the car. But then now I know that once I hit 12 and become kind of a person, yeah. they, she loves it. She loves telling the stories to her friends the next, the next day at school or her teachers. She's always asking when we can go on the next one. She's always kind of interested in my books. She's reading the books. So she, she's yeah. a big inspiration for me, for sure. Yeah, that's yeah. a wonderful she, thing Can she recite do. the Raven as well? She can. In fact, she um, she just took some of my Poe stuff into class because her homeroom teacher is a big Poe fan as well. So I got to I give her a book to sign and I have a bunch of artifacts. I have a mask and I have a, yeah. whatever, bobbleheads and stuff. So she took a bunch in there and did like a whole presentation. So yeah, she's big into them now. And I think she's about halfway through memorizing it. She's, she's, Wait, yeah. so she got are you going to give us a little, your favorite phrase? Come on, just give us a few lines. You must. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, my favorite is uh, in the, was it in this, in the bleak December, each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor is great. It just yeah. it just hits that that evening and like you're just, you feel that December moment, just feel it in that one line, you know, each separate and the way you could rhyme like the middle of words and the rhythm yeah. is just no. I'm not even a fan of poetry anymore, yeah. but that I, I the uh, pose poetry is just so intricate and beautiful. I wish all poetry was like that. Yeah. You know, I, as you were talking about him earlier, I was thinking about Annabelle Lee because he had yeah. such an obsession, you know, but this is wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, coming on our, our uh, podcast and just talking about this stuff. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no, it was a blast. I, thank you for having me on here. It was, it was fun to talk to you guys. And we're yeah. going to ask backwards, but just um, introduce yourself and say, you know, you have such a great website, a great resource. You have your podcast. I think you do them with your daughter. It's done a few. I think I was mm -hmm. listening. Sounds like. Yeah. Just so people can come and find and get your newest book. So where would we send people, JW? Sure. So if you're going to learn anything about me, go to oddthingsiveseen.com. So that's going to have, you're going to be able to find my books, my podcast, a bunch of free articles. I've been writing for 10 years, my, my oddity trips, pictures like crazy. Everything about me resolves around that site. And I just call it Otis for short. That's the acronym. Odd things okay. I've seen. And also, I guess you won't be doing any NFTs anytime soon if you like actual real objects. What <laughs> well, you know, who says can an NFT, NFT be, be cursed? Be yes. Can an NFT be cursed? Yes. Anything, anything that's a thing can be cursed, even digital objects. All yeah. right. Well, that's good to know. Jesse, okay. beware. Beware. Okay. Thank you, JW. Thank you so much, guys. Bye, you guys. Bye.